Income tax 2022-2023. Other itemized deductions tax software examples. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Here we are in our example form 1040 populated using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to the form 1040 related forms and schedules at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov, starting point, single filer. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Mr. Anderson, 100,000 W-2 income, 12,950 for the standard deductions, getting us down to the 87,050, mirroring that over here on our tax worksheet calculation. And then we're letting the software do the tax calculation on page two, 14,774, 15,000 withheld, getting us to the 226, mirroring that in our worksheet 14774 15000 withheld 226 we're mainly concerned however with the top part of the equation looking at the income tax or taxable income calculation so let's go back to that first page we're focused down here on the itemized or the standard deductions remembering we only take the itemized deductions if they're greater than the standard deductions however we could have an exception to that general rule there's a general rule well, in essence if we have a qualified disaster type of situation which we talked about a little bit in a prior presentation but we'll touch on here otherwise it's usually the case that these other deductions are probably not going to be the thing that pushes people over the main thing that pushes people over is the home purchase and that means that you might have a loan related to it which causes mortgage interest deductible and then the uh property taxes which are the two big ones we'd have to clear 12,950 single 25,900 before we benefit let's check it out on the schedule a to see it in more detail schedule a and then the big ones are the taxes and the interest here but we're focused down here on the cash on the other itemized deductions so the one big one that could come into play which will be unique to a particular area or a particular disaster is the qualified disaster and if there is one or any kind of federally declared disaster which may be leveled up to a qualified disaster and we talked about that more in a prior presentation so we'll just touch on it here but you can do more research by looking up the disaster on the IRS website, possibly the FEMA website, looking at the instructions for form uh, 4684 and then diving into more detail on the specific problem that may have happened in your particular location. Now, remember, if it's just a qualified disaster, then it might be up here in the casualty and theft laws. I'm sorry, if it's just a federally declared disaster, it might be up here. And then if it's a qualified disaster, it might be pulled down here into the other itemized deductions where even if you're not clear in the standard deduction, it might still have a benefit. So let's give a quick recap on that. This is coming from form 4684. So if I scroll down to 4684, 4684, we've got the casualty and theft losses that will typically be populated in a form that's going to be like uh, disbursements like a schedule d for for the capital gains and i'll just put the property again the date acquired i'm going to say is negative 010122 or let's not say 22 let's say it was sometime a few years ago 20 date sold the date of the disaster 061522 let's say sales price zero the cost ten thousand same example example we saw before in a prior presentation so there we have it and then i'm going to go to the casualty and theft information and say it was let's say a fire and then we would pick the designation personal property 
disaster that happened. And then there's a dis distinction between the qualified disaster and the non-qualified uh, disaster. So there's a difference in the reporting between those two. I won't pick the actual code right now. We'll come back to that in a second, but I'm picking non-qualified at this point. Fair market value of the casualty, I'm gonna say is less than the cost. And I'm gonna say we got re-compensated for insurance. Fair market, cal fair market value determined safe harbor insurance of 100 or 1000, I'm gonna say. So let's just see what that populates in uh, the software. So I pull back on over here to 4684 and you can see it's basically taking the rule for, for a loss that's a federally declared disaster, but not qualified, I believe is the way to state it. And so we've got the $100 deduction, but there's also that 10% of the AGI, which basically wipes it out, which means it's not being pulled over here uh, to the Schedule A. Now, I'm going to adjust that. I'm going to bring the income level down, let's say, to 50000 Let's bring it down to 50000 And then if I go back on over, you would think that it would, it would pull over now, but it's still not pulling over. Oh, we'll pull over. We'll pull over. Pull over. Pull over because it's gonna be limited. So if I scroll down, I could see it pulling over at 2,900, but I'm not over the threshold to itemize. So it's not pulling, uh, it's not helping at that point in time. However, if now I say, let's pull it back up, I'm gonna say, let's pull my income back up to 100,000. Now it's not populating here at all, but now I'm going to say it's a qualified disaster, which means it's going to move it from the casualty and theft losses down to where we're focused, other itemized deductions. Let's do that. So now I'm going to go back into my disbursements and I'm going to say that it's now a, quali a federally declared qualified disaster. Now note that you would want to pick the actual disaster, make sure that you're doing your research to, to drill down on how to properly record this for the unique area that you're particularly in your tax software should have uh, the information in it because it was declared and it's usually it might have a fema code and whatnot that you can then tie in and do more research on for that particular issue but just to see the general flow now i'm going to flow it back on over and you can see that we have the form 4684 is now being populated, calculated a little bit differently for the qualified disaster. We don't have that 10% of AGI thing going on. We get to the calculation of that 7,500 pulling into the Schedule A, but now it's down here on the other itemized deductions. And, and even though I wasn't itemizing, it basically took that 7,500 plus the, the floor the, of the standard deduction, the 12,950 that normally I have to clear before itemizing and just adds it in there so that I basically get the advantage of taking the net qualified disaster, even though I'm not, I'm not uh, itemizing. So that's huge. I mean, that could be a big, a big deal. And that pulls on over to the first page. So that's kind of an exception to that general rule that you'd have to clear the itemized. It's itemized. It did clear the itemized deductions, but it did so by adding the 12,950 to the itemized deductions. So you have to kind of be aware of that uh, in the specific area. So if you have a qualified disaster uh, or federally declared disaster of any kind, you probably want to drill down and look at the specifics on how to calculate uh, that unique uh, situation. And it's, it's unique because every situation will have its own code, but the general rules for a qualified disaster uh, uh, and a federally declared disaster will, will generally apply if that category had been applied to whatever disaster you're dealing with, but you wanna drill down on that. Okay, so I'm gonna undo that. Let's say, let's remove that craziness. I'm gonna say, let's get that, delete that out of here. And that puts us back to where we were before. So now we've got the 100,000 and the 12,950. Now let's imagine the other, the other kind of common one in this area, which is that gambling loss situation. Now, remember in practice, you might have some clients that like to gamble a lot. And so they, so you want them to be aware of, you know, collecting their losses so that if they have any winnings or when they have any winnings, cause eventually you will have winnings. Although you would expect the losses to be greater if you're doing gambling at a, at a 
horse track or a casino or particularly a casino or something like that. So you want to be, you know, you want to be tracking uh, your losses so that you might be able to get some benefit from them, but you're probably only going to get a benefit from them if you're itemizing because because the gambling losses themselves aren't usually going to kick kick you over. So remember the general idea of a loss from a natural loss for an income tax perspective would be if it was something to help you generate revenue, it would be a legitimate loss for income taxes, which you could see on the Schedule C, for example, where which is basically an income statement with income and then expenses. These expenses are the most natural kind of thing that you would expect from an income tax system to be able to deduct because it's fair to tax people on the net income, not the gross income. But when you look at most people that have W-2 income, the thought process is that the 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 uh, employer is taking care of the expenses and therefore all the deductions that we usually look at, these Schedule A deductions are actually kind of incentives oftentimes that aren't like natural deductions that you would expect in an income tax type of system. Now with gambling losses, you might say, hey, look, I'm trying to earn money through gambling. I should be able to deduct the expenses, which kind of makes sense, but it's not really an, something that the government wants to incentivize. And it's not like a, an act that you're doing for profit uh, generally over here. It's kind of more like a hobby or a specific area. So therefore, you don't typically get the deduction over here, but you might be able to get the deduction on the Schedule A, which is of course much worse because you'd have to be clearing the itemized deductions before you can take that. Uh, other times you might be dealing with people that just basically went to Vegas and they happened to win something and they got a W2G or something like that. Uh, in that case, same same kind of thing applies. Uh, you, you only get the you only get the losses up to the winnings and it's a Schedule A type of thing. So the situation would be as we saw before, they would probably have a W2G of income that's on Schedule One. That we'd have to say, okay, now they had gambling winnings, W2G. I'm just gonna say, okay, W2G winnings, let's say 5,000 or whatever. They didn't withhold anything, let's say. And now we've got that included in income. And the question is, well, they're gonna say, yeah, but I spent a lot more than that much, maybe they might say on, on gambling. <laughs> it, maybe not 5,000, I don't know how much they spend on gambling, but depends on what you're doing. So I've watched the movie Rounders and they they that's nothing man they the swings are huge in the, on the poker table but in any case then if I go to the schedule A we can have the losses over here if I jump to that won't let me jump to let's go over here and just go deductions for schedule A miscellaneous itemized deductions and there we have them, the gambling losses. So gambling losses, actually that's an override right here. It goes in the same area as the gains. So I can put them in here, the gambling losses. So there they are. All right, let's say they, let's say I lost like uh, 8,000. I spent 8,000 to win 5,000. Well then if I pull that on over to the schedule A, it's going to cap it gambling losses to the extent of the winnings notice it writes it in here because there wasn't like a, a, a just like a category for it writes it in here 5,000 but that 5,000 isn't enough to clear the 12,000 uh, itemized deduction threshold so if I go back on over then it's not being uh, pulled over here obviously if the losses were less than the winnings then it would take like 4,000 it would take the 4,000 up to capped at the number of the winnings. So if I go back down, there's the 4,000. So clearly the thing that would push people over to being able to itemize are the interest on the home. So if they own a home, then their gambling habit, maybe they can support their gambling habit more because they can take <laughs> the deductions. So we're going to say then we've got, let's say there was 12,000 here and then the taxes, we've got real estate, 3000. And so then if they're already itemizing, then it's going to become more relevant to to pick up those gambling losses if they had gambling winnings, they can pull into the first page of the 10 the 1040. And so the general idea is, is to, if you're dealing with someone that gambles a lot, then you might want to tell them uh that yeah, you should be tracking your losses 
especially if you're itemizing so that you can take the losses. And if you gamble a whole lot, then maybe the losses will be sufficient enough to kind of push you over to itemizing. But usually they're not because they would have to clear the 12,950 or the 25,009. So if they don't own a home, they not, might not be able to do that. If there's someone that doesn't gamble a lot, but they're just going to Vegas and they're going to go gamble, then maybe, you know, you want to, you want to say, well, might, might be worth holding on to your losses, receipts of your losses or something like that. In the event that you happen to get just one windfall win for whatever reason, so that you might have the information to support the losses because remember that if you get audited for the deduction of the losses they, they're going to want to know the evidence of the losses so then the question is is it worthwhile for you to track the evidence of the losses if you're going to vegas or something or if you're you know doing some kind of gambling where you might be able to deduct the losses if you happen to actually win something and it kind of depends on how much you might win and whether or not you'll be able to deduct the losses and whether or not you are itemizing if I put that over here on, on our worksheet over here, by the way, we had gambling winnings before, I thought. Did we have gambling winnings before on other income? <clears throat> Maybe not. So let's just add schedule one gambling winnings. Is that how you spell gambling? I'm going to gamble that that is correct. It is correct. I win. I didn't put any money down. Dang it. I'm not that good at gambling anymore. Anyway, so let's say, what did I say it was? Uh, we won 5,000. And then we'll say that this is boom. And let's put some borders around this. Gambling winnings. That would pull over to the 1040. And then the losses would be part of the itemized deductions. So if I went into the schedule A in our worksheet and we said... Let's say we had gambling, it's, it's casualty, other, other items. Let's just add it here. I'm going to add some space. Give me some room, man. Cry crowding me. You're crowding me over here. All right. So we're going to say this is going to be gambling losses. And, and then let's say that was 4,000. We said 4,000 total gain total other itemized deductions summing that up on this side boom shakalaka and then is the spelling okay medical medical change it change it okay i wasn't even checking that part but whatever so that only adds up to 4,000 right now. So it doesn't pull over. So now it's not over. So we would be taking the lesser of still the standard. But if I had my other uh, ones here, the mortgage interest, which I said was 12,000, real estate taxes, which I think I said, what, 3,000? And then the state taxes are going to be calculated. I'll let the software do that uh, for me. 1,017, 1,017, 1017. That brings us up to the 20,017. Scrolling down, 20,017. Pulling over to the page one of the 1040, 100,000 minus the, or plus the income 105 minus the 20,017 gives us the 84,983. So let's see if that matches up. 105 minus the greater of 12,950 or 20,017 gives us the 84,983. So there it is. So there's just an example. I won't get into the second half of the tax calculation at this point because we're really kind of focusing in on that first half of the formula. We'll get into that second half in future sections, which will be great.